Welcome to another segment of our In the Game series. Uh, today we are uh, pleased to have with us uh, co-founder of Corver Coaching, Mr. Charlie Cook. Um, Charlie, uh, you're in California. How's the weather today? Well, in fact, uh, the, it's, it's pretty good today. In fact, it's, it was kind of foggy the last few days, but uh, today it's turning out to be a beautiful day, lovely sunny day, um, lovely temperatures. We're told there's some heavy rain coming, but uh, as of now, very nice. Wow. Rain in California. Uh, that'd be rare. <laughs> um, I, I do want to, before we get too far in, I do want to cover one tidbit here. And it's one of the things you shared with me one time. And, you know, not many people uh, know that, you know, outside of your playing and professional career, that uh, you have other hobbies. Uh, and one of the things that you like to do to uh, stay in shape and, you know, I guess, socialize is uh, play squash. You know, tell us about that. One of the things that happened to me, sure, I don't know if it happens to many of the, the pro players today, but in my day, which was a long, long time ago, of course, you know, two, life, two lifetimes ago for most people, uh, we always assumed we were never, uh, for example, I never did went ski, skiing for, for many years, and even after I was stopped playing. Uh, so I must have been in my mid-40s, even my 50s, when I first went skiing. And partly that was because we always assumed uh, that the clubs always discouraged us from other sports that were perhaps dangerous to your, uh, your health, <laughs> or whatever way it might be. Uh, they didn't want injuries and so on. And so I'd always avoided other sports like skiing. And uh, although I, I could recognize squash as a, a sport that was there, certainly in Britain at that time, uh, it was not something I ever participated in. Anyway, I had got out the game and living my life in the U.S. I've been in the U.S. for 45 years now, but I'm living in the U.S. and uh, I got a chance in a local health club to be a squash racket coach, and so I thought I'd try a couple of times, and I did it, and was useless at it. Absolutely, still I'm pretty useless, but uh, I suddenly realised this is a different game. Different game requires a lot of different skills that. I had no idea, and if I had no idea, there's many other people out there that had even less of an idea what squash is and how difficult, how, how demanding a game physically <laughs> and emotionally, as all <laughs> sports are. Uh, but um, I immediately recognized that, and I could see it was uh, something I enjoyed. I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed, enjoyed the competitiveness of it, uh, but played it at a very, very low level, just scoffing about with somebody who could uh, who's who happened to be around and wanted to play it wasn't a case of picking up the phone and calling some person who i knew play squash and say let's arrange a game and let's go down and do it and we'll book a court there was nothing like that it was turning up at the club and if it happened to somebody there and they wanted to play yeah let's have a game so that uh, that was the start of my interest and that was in cincinnati where i lived for many years but it was only a very kind of casual uh, experience of the, of the sport for a couple of years or so, but nothing serious. But since I've come to Southern California, I joined another club. Uh, we have a group of enthusiastic, I mean, a, a good group of uh, enthusiastic guys from all over the world, guys from India, guys from Pakistan, where the, the game is very popular, the guys from all over the world, but also guys who just take your part, you know, take, <laughs> I've got no chance against you. But, uh, you know, occasionally you get to play with the, the very good players and you just, you just see the difference in the abilities, difference in physical ability to move around the court and get things done and get back in position and so on for the next shot. Uh, and it's, it's not a quick game like uh, racquetball where the ball bounces hugely. It's a ball, it's a thing you've got to be on your toes, you've got to be ready for the next shot. And so the physical demands were, were huge. They are huge. And uh, one of my uh, pleasures today is watching a professional circuit, the, the pro, pro squash circuit, uh, the Whittle circuit, where they go to different places. They play uh, one of the Whittle series in uh, Grand Central Station, or they do it, say, in front of the, the floodlit pyramids. Uh, in, in Egypt and so all that kind of stuff they, they play in some fantastic locations uh, but the quality 
and the athleticism of the, of the players is astonishing, astonishing. And uh, so I play at my, <laughs> my mini level here in Southern California. But, uh, it sounds like maybe your uh, your history of uh, or your your playing career, you know, uh, being starting in Aberdeen, moving to Dundee, uh, and moving on to Chelsea uh, in England, and uh, you know, at, at that time a world record transfer fee for a player, um, and then uh, actually, you know, one year I guess a, a stint over in Crystal Palace, and then heading to the U.S. and then playing in the pro leagues and the indoor leagues here uh, in the U.S. Um, obviously, all that activity and, you know, the type of player that you were and, and, and uh, apparently still are on the squash court, um, you know, that uh, you, the competitive spirit is built into you and it still comes out no matter what sport you're going to enter into. Well, the funny thing about that, Dave, is, you know, it, it may be a natural thing to say that competitive instinct and so on, and yet uh, I think that's probably there. I'm not so sure it's necessarily an instinct. I, I, certainly, it was always, I've always had that edge about wanting to win and so on and so forth, but I'm, I don't necessarily think it's a, a strength sometimes, you know. This, uh, shall we say, an aggressive competitive instinct from soccer. It's, it's all from soccer, from playing soccer, and the way you, you always you know, react to any decisions against you. I would kind of, kind of add competitive spirit, although it may, 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 have, uh, may, may come from my genes and so on. It also comes very much from soccer, and it's a competitive uh, conduct that I don't think translates well to other sports. Everything in soccer is demonstrative. You raise your hands, you complain to the referee, you, you turn to other players and look for, uh, you know, assistance and so on. And it's not that way in, in squash. And so I think that's a, 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 a good difference, a beneficial difference to me and my, my kind of personality. Well, with that said, um, from your days as a player, uh, what do you see as a major difference uh, in a modern game player? Well, I think that, that there are many things, obviously, a lot of water has run under the bridge since I played. That's what we're talking here 40, 50 years ago, 50, almost 60 years ago, 50 years ago. And uh, many, many factors. A uh, huge factor for me is uh, there's been much, much coach, a lot of coaching and coaching development. Having said that, I think TV soccer, televised soccer, has done much of the job for us coaches. Uh, I think it's done more coaching and helped more players to understand the game, helped more coaches to understand the game, and also for players and teams to play the game better uh, simply by watching the game and observing the kind of intuitive lessons that you're, you're, you're absorbing uh, from watching the games being played. Uh, the very idea that uh, getting ugly and uh, being angry uh, under pressure if you see enough games on television, you realize it really doesn't work. It really doesn't work to lose, lose your emotions and be crazy. And now, it's certainly it's great to be emotional and pour huge amounts of energy into certain aspects of a game in certain circumstances or at certain times. I look at guys like, say, for example, Ronaldo, uh, Lionel Messi, and the abuse they take week in, week out, and they control the show. I admire that hugely. Yeah. Well, from a, a player perspective, let's look at player for player, okay? So uh, a Peter Osgood uh, uh, of your Chelsea, and let's look at a Ronaldo. Uh, you know, what do you see, uh, obviously, in the, in the player differences, but what tendencies in the game in that time period of you and the tendencies of the game in the time period of now in a Ronaldo, what do you see as the major differences? Well, let me go back to you, just the previous question, because I didn't answer it properly, but it's all tied up with uh, how that affects players today, how it affected players then. Uh, the differences uh, we talked about, I talked about TV, televised soccer, and the advantages, the benefits that's, that's uh, given players and coaches uh, for decades now. Uh, if you think back in the time we played, uh, you look at the, the surfaces they're playing upon. I mean, uh, the, the fields that we played on were just normal, normal fields, well manicured, 
beautifully laid out before the game, but they were all at the mercy of uh, the, that particular season. So if you get to a, a winter season in Britain, many of the fields were very, very heavy. Uh, and certainly the areas in front of the goals in the penalty areas were definitely muddy and very often had puddles in them, for example. And there was just no way around that. That's just the reality of the game. And so when it comes to, say, uh, players playing today, they're playing in a carpet where, where you stick a ball in. And even if they're surrounded by players, if their touch is good, uh, they've got a chance of uh, getting themselves out, out of trouble if they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. But as many times I, I can remember playing a ball into a central, uh, a forward, say, Aussie or Ian Hutchinson, who'd be playing for us. But they'd be in a, a mud heap in the middle of the, the, the middle of the penalty area, or say the edge of the penalty area, the, the arc at the penalty area. And you're playing a ball in, say, from somewhere in midfield, and you're playing, and you're running off the ball to try and help them get it back and, and help things to develop. But you know the difficulty of these, these guys had, uh, not only receiving the ball, skidding off a, a muddy field, but the mud itself, they maybe control the ball beautifully, it then falls into a kind of mud puddle or a kind of heavy part of the field. And uh, at that time, slide tackling, of course, was kind of allowed in Britain. That was kind of acknowledged as a pretty good thing to do. And so uh, referees would not give fouls away uh, uh, at that time that they would do today. You know, any kind of tackling from behind, so it was not allowed. But then a tackling, those kind of tackles were allowed and very heavy, heavy abuse, shall we say, uh, with uh, forwards playing with their back to goal. That happened all the time then. And you add that to the muddy fields, and I think the, the difficulty faced by forwards, century, certainly central forwards, the, the guys who are supposed to be scoring goals, uh, it was a totally different, uh, a, a different scenario than the, they have today. So, uh, that affected the skills they developed and how they had to play. Well, let's, let's expand on that. Let's go back in history a little bit. Uh, you, your time with Chelsea uh, probably was highlighted by the uh, Cup Winners' Cup uh, victory in 1971 against Real Madrid. Uh, back then, the Cup Winners' Cup, if I understand it correctly, was the Cup winners from several or European countries came together for this one competition. You guys have found your way through all the way to the final against Real Madrid. Uh, but tell us about that, because that actually went into a two-game series, didn't it? Yeah, in fact, um, I, I always forget that uh, it went to a two-game series. Uh, but any, any fans, Chelsea fans, will immediately remind you in detail of how it all went. But uh, we played on a Wednesday evening. We were a, a, a goal up and cruising to a win, we thought. And uh, so uh, they were already setting up the, the presentation areas and everybody assumed the game was kind of almost over. And Real scored in the, in the dying second, dying minutes of the game. And so it was, had to be replayed. And it was hastily replayed on the, the Friday night. But the highlight, I think, that most fans, and certainly we as the players would have said, was just the year before uh, when we went to the, the FA Cup final and we beat Leeds. Now, I know Leeds uh, have, both clubs uh, have, have had varying fortunes over the many years since. But at that time, Leeds were a key club, a key club in, in, in Britain and in Europe. And I always felt at that time uh, could rival any club, Real Madrid, any other club, uh, as far as keeping the ball, moving the ball around and playing possession soccer. They were at, almost at the forefront of that. Uh, we didn't realize how much that would become part of the game in total, today, for example, mm -hmm. the possession of soccer is, is the, the rigor kind of thing for any 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 ambitious club. But then they they led led by a mile at uh, possession of soccer, and they were a great team, tough team to play against, and so on. And so when we beat them in the FA Cup final, that was a replay. Uh, uh, went from the, the Wembley final. It was a, a tie, and we beat them on, uh, I think, two or three weeks later at uh, Old Trafford. And so I think that would have been the highlight of that period because it was a, 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 it was a fantastic period for Chelsea, the Chelsea club at the time. 
And that's why that's one of the reasons I'm so proud of being part of Chelsea at that time. It was one of the highlights of uh, their whole history. That uh, certainly from the period I went, I went in '66 through '77. Uh, but '66 through I would say '71, '72 was a fantastic period for the club, and I was part of it all. And I, I always look back and yeah, I'm very grateful that I was part of it. You know, uh, but those those games were certainly highlights. But I only mention that the, the, the Cup Winners' Cup was a kind of postscript thing. Simply were two very great highlights uh, during that period. Well, let's uh, let's fast forward into uh, the last 36 years of what you've been doing as a co-founder of Corver Coaching with uh, Alfred Glustian. Did you ever imagine or dream that it would have grown into a global company where it is today? I'd be, uh, I'd be lying about that, I'd be saying yes. But uh, first of all, let me uh, pay tribute to the kind of traveling that Alfred has done and uh, the ambassadorial role he's played in, in visiting and creating and making contacts and doing things and getting things done. He's done a fantastic job there, I can't tell you. I've been a kind of stay-at-home guy who's never ventured very far, but Alfred's been the guy who's been the globetrotter and uh, all, all credit to him for that. Did a fantastic job. Having oh. said that, uh, it'd be crazy to say that's what we always envisaged. Uh, and yet, knowing our absolute passion for it and our belief in it, it I almost feel as if I'm being um, disloyal and saying, no, we never thought it would uh, 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 we didn't think that because in a way we felt that was the right way. This is the way people should play the game. This is the way we should coach young players. And so uh, I feel disloyal if I, I, I kind of fakey, I'm faking it if I say we didn't think it would spread because deep down we felt it was the right way. So uh, um, having said that, Dave, how did it come to pass? Well, uh, I can remember sitting in my kitchen with Alfred, and I know how the, the Premier Player Development, the, one of our core core icons, you get many icons that show our, our player pathway. But I remember sitting there and we looked upon it as a, a blank, it, it was like a blackboard. You've got a blackboard, you've got a piece of chalk. How are we going to figure this out? How are we going to uh, tell people about Corba coaching without always having to use a thousand pages of words to describe the simplest idea. And so the icons have become a kind of icon of corporate coaching, if you want to call it that. We have many icons now, and they're, they're, people may look at it and think, oh, they're pretty. For me, they're huge, absolutely huge. They embody all the things that we think about, all our deepest and <laughs> most superficial thoughts, but they embody all these things. And uh, I, I think it, when you give them some thought, so from our perspective, they make sense. Uh, the whole idea, you, you may have heard me talk about this before, Dave, and I don't want to bore you, but I can remember at the time, Alf and I were sitting there, and there was a lucky thing happened for us. Maybe it's because of our personalities. Maybe we should give ourselves credit and think, well, we kind of saw something. I don't mean to pat ourselves in the back. But it was an idea that came up. It was only Ten years later, I saw it published in, uh, what was it, the, the Seven Habits of the uh, Highly Successful People. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was a bestseller book, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Anyway, of those seven habits, the, the number two one was a thing that happened to us that we had done. We, we didn't even realize it was a habit. But uh, it was a uh, start with the end in mind. That was his number two habit. I forget the other ones, but the number two habit was start with the end in mind. Well, that's what we had done. And what we had done, and this is, here I'm getting onto a subject I'm really kind of, I've run off at the mouth about, but uh, it's so huge to me. The idea then was, uh, what are we trying to do? We were both asking ourselves, actually asking ourselves that question face to face, and all asking the same question to ourselves, internally, what are we trying to do here? 
And what I think was a huge thing for, for me anyway, the whole idea all kind of came down to the cover kid. What is the thing we're trying to create? What are we trying to develop? What are the things we're going to put all our energy into? Why are we putting our energy into that? Is it just another coaching system? Or is there something more to it? Always for me was the coach, the core of a kid. The idea of what do you bring to the young player to make them number one enthusiastic? Or how do you make them enthusiastic? How do you get them excited about the game? And how do we, how do we kind of, pass over these, these kind of passions that we have to the kid. And so the idea of the core of a kid was, it's always been there. It's always behind everything, certainly I think about the game. Uh, and I think that's one of the things, one of the things that attracted so many people to it. This idea of how do you do, how do you, how do you pass over these ideas, uh, these qualities that you think are so important, as well as all the skills. And the thing that we it began with was, great players and great teams. And using great players and great teams as our examples, that's what was built upon. It was built upon the, the qualities and the skills of the greatest stars of the game. So we had the Cruyff turn, Litbarski step on, uh, the, 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 the uh, Rivellino step over, that kind of thing. The, many of the skills were built upon the skills of the great stars of the game. And that's how every kid learns any game, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a baseball player, you, you, you're thinking of all the great stars of the game and all the damages and all the rest of it. Uh, if you're going to say boxing, you're thinking of you know the great boxers. Uh, if you're going to squash, uh, I'm thinking Jonah Barrington. Uh, and so those kind of things all kind of come together uh, and they end up being becoming the covered icons, our pathway, and the icons that take us there. And so the pyramid of player development, development, pyramid of moves, pyramid of ball mastery. Uh, these are all ideas that look kind of abstract, but they're all focused on that one thing as that core of a kid. And I think the core of a kid is a thing that gives life to everything for me in core of a coaching and what we're doing. And I say for me, I'm not excluding anybody. I'm saying that's the way I think everybody reacts to it in some subtle kind of way. I don't want to be here speaking for anybody else. But uh, it's a thing that energizes me and always inspires me that uh, it's a corporate kid. It's not just an icon, it's a big corporate kid. So if we stay on that topic of the corporate kid, trying to create that corporate kid, I got to put you on the spot. So in the modern game, who would you say is ingrained in that corporate kid evolution and playing now? Absolutely. It just comes easy. Lionel Messi. Now, it's much more than just what skills he may have. He doesn't do step overs and fakes like we, we often teach. Uh, although he, he can do them if he wants. If he, want, he can do anything he wants, almost. But there's many other things that I can see reflect what we want to see in our kids and take into the, the, their adult life. Uh, for example, Messi, I think is calm under pressure. It's fantastic. Now he, it's been a learning process. He used to be a young kid who kind of reacted, I think. But uh, he certainly calmed down. And I think he's a, he's a picture of calm. When you see even the most extreme situations that uh, Barcelona get involved in, and they don't get involved many, let's face it, I think they're a pretty calm team. They're, they're pretty calm, even in the most, the wildest circumstances. And you can be sure they're, they're involved in, probably more high pressure situations than almost any club in the world. Uh, so I think Messi is a captain. He plays that role beautifully. Now there was, I read recently, I tell this to people, but I can't prove it. And I may have, I may have been imagining it, but uh, there was a press clipping I read, no, I don't know, it was the middle of last season, where one of the stars, and I even forget who the star, star was, he had just been traded, been transferred to, uh, Barcelona, and he was. They were talking. He was talking with the teammates about uh, in the locker room about where he should stay while he was getting used to being in Barcelona and moving his family and so on and so forth. And they were all saying, "Oh, come and come and stay with me, or you can do this, do do whatever." Or they were suggesting hotels or whatever. And I, he said, uh, 
Oh, Lionel says, I should, I, I, I'm very welcome to come to his home. I stay with Lionel, his family. And the guys all said, oh, don't, don't go there. And he looked at me, don't go there. He said, he'll have you practicing 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, that, that, that's Corver coaching. That was me and the Corver kid. That was the Corver kid to me. Now, that may be... <laughs> that, that may be an exaggerated story or it may not even be a story at all but I can remember reading it somewhere and I, I thought it, it clicked with me that I think that's accurate now it, couldn't, it may not be and I may be wrong but I believe that the skills that Messi shows and the things that he does cannot come just naturally you have to put in the hours you have to put in the sweat and toil and the unrecognized hours to be able to do the things he, he does. For example, the simple thing of kicking a ball or striking it to uh, win the goal at a certain place from a certain distance, he seems to be able to do it almost across the field. There was one clip where he, he kicked the ball across the field having fun at the practice and he, he knocked a, a, a a reporter's hat off or something, or whatever. He, he, he pretended that let's do something. And so he kicked the ball a prodigious distance. And it happened. You know, it wasn't trick photography. It happened. You know, uh, that kind of accuracy and that kind of uh, skill, it, you cannot do that without the proverbial 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours somewhere, much of it probably alone, unheralded, unapplauded, and even perhaps even uh, 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 maybe even uh, people have been derided. Those guys who want to go in, spend their time doing these things. Similarly with Ronaldo, I don't think he can have these finishing skills and striking, striking power and accuracy without prodigious practice. David Beckham w was always kind of reputed to be that way too. Last guy off the training field, always practicing striking the ball in certain ways, whatever he, whatever the thing was he had decided to do well, he would practice. That for me, these for me are all connected to the Corver kid. That is a Corver kid. Uh, those kind of qualities of selfless commitment uh, to your own development. Uh, and one other thing I would add there is that uh, they're also, uh, these guys, the, the Ronaldos, the Messis, and the Beckhams, they all seem to be pretty well, well-developed and mature individuals now. And I think they show the maturity we want our corporate kids to eventually develop. Not, not maturity under pressure and they understand the situations. And I think they handle them very, very well. But I, I believe it all comes from what I think we are trying to inculcate in our kids. That idea of uh, you cannot do it without, we're not saying 10,000 hours, but certainly prodigious practice. It is the, the kind of image, I can see the image of a, a glow around the Corver kid. That is a Corver kid, and he's, he's somehow, these guys can represent a, cor, a mature Corver, Corver kid to me. Guys who are mature under pressure, but have fantastic skills and perform under pressure. Charlie, you've been so gracious with your time today. Thank you so much for, you know, giving us an insight in uh, some of your experiences. Um, we look forward to speaking with you again. Uh, this uh, In the Game series, we'll have other segments uh, coming along with different professionals and uh, their viewpoints on the game. Uh, in this moment of, uh, you know, this unprecedented COVID uh, pandemic, um, yeah, I would be remiss not to say that, you know, for the safety of everybody in, in our whole society in this world, you know, keeping our social distances at this point and our personal hygiene of uh, making sure we're washing our hands as much as possible. Um, it, it can't be said enough, uh, but with that said, Charlie, thank you so much for all of your time. Um, and, it, you know, from, from me personally and my family, uh, being able to be connected with your passion and what we were trying to do in growing these Corver kids into these mature people. Uh, it's my passion as well. And I, I thank you for that opportunity. So with that, I want to say thank you. And uh, we look forward to the next segment. Thank you, Dave. It's been a pleasure.